Good afternoon. Welcome to West Texas a University. I'm very happy to see that we are here on this seminar. Let me explain to you uh, the reason why I'll be doing it. Uh, Phi Beta Delta Honor Society for International Scholars. It has about 120 chapters nationwide. They have chapters in uh, at the Tech, UT, AM, Baylor, UT Dallas, UT Arlington, so all this area. It has, I think, uh, maybe last time I was talking to them, they said it may have gone beyond 120. But uh, we opened this chapter in 1987, and some of the founding members are Raju Ramakrishna, myself, Pete Peterson, and uh, Bob Beckley. Uh, this has, uh, chapter has done a lot of activities. In 1994, we won the Best Chapter Award in this region, and uh, out of the uh, about uh, 50 chapters. Anyway, what we do is uh, every month we meet for a luncheon meeting, but once a year we have a pretty big meeting like this, and this time we are very fortunate to collaborate with Amarillo College, and we have two speakers from Amarillo College, uh, Professor uh, Carl Schuster, and uh, he's a biologist, and uh, David Zimmerman, Professor David Zimmerman is, uh, teaches English, of course, from our university. We have Chris Byerberg, Professor of uh, History, and uh, Professor of Economics, uh, we have uh, Pat Kelso. Now, uh, I also want you to uh, meet our president. I'm the chapter chair, and uh, we have a president, uh, Dr. Jennifer Coles. She's sitting here. We have uh, our uh, treasurer, Dr. Joan Rivera. She's sitting over there. Dr. Sharma Zaldas is our vice president. I don't know if she's here or no. Sharma Zaldas? She's 81. So oh, okay. Oh, okay. And then uh, I do want you uh, to meet our president, Dr. Long, Russell Long, he's over there, and uh, Dr. Jerry Miller. And we do have a lot of guests from Amarillo, so I'm very, very happy, and I welcome you all to West Texas a &M. Now, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this uh, Phi Beta Delta Honor Society? And I'm going to read uh, very quickly our organization, a few things. It was started at Long Beach, uh, Cal State Long Beach. Uh, as I said, there are more than 120 chapters. The purpose of this society is to recognize and encourage high professional, intellectual, and personal achievements in the field of international education. So it's not only for international business. It does have any, all the disciplines. So it has disciplines, sociology, anthropology, biology, agriculture. So basically, it's a collection of all the disciplines. Phi is love of knowledge, beta value of human life, and Delta achieving excellence. The colors of the society are red and gold and symbolizing the strength of humankind and the energy of the sun from which all people and cultures draw strength and life. Now, we have our banquet once a year and if you are inducted into the society since it's an honor society, undergraduate, you must have 3.0 GPA and graduate, you must have 3.5. We do give you this medal and I guarantee you this medal is better than the Olympics, you know, medal we gave. <laughs> and you will be given this medal. We also publish, I mean, the, the society's headquarters, they publish twice a year this journal. And there are two individuals from this university, they have published articles in this journal. Our uh, newsletter, our newsletter is, it looks like this. And uh, every newsletter, we have made it to the newsletter. We make sure that our activities are mentioned and the new current, uh, the current newsletter does have our activities. So this was a brief introduction about our society. Today's program, we are going to talk about a very controversial book, which has been out in the last one year. It has been reviewed by New York Times, CNN, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Washington Post, I mean, you name any big newspaper or periodical in this world, and they have reviewed this book, and the title of the book is The Clash of Civilization and the Remaking of World Order. A very heavy title, and the author is from Harvard University, and his name is Samuel, Samuel P. Huntington. He used to work for uh, Mr. Uh, Jimmy Carter. He was uh, one of the policy advisors. 
And basically, what he said was that he said that after the Cold War, there are a lot of other wars are being created. A lot of people are fighting. A lot of people are fighting on the basis of cultures, on the basis of values, on the basis of societal, all these deals. And that is having a big impact on international business and international trade. So that's the whole purpose. But some of the things which Mr. Huntington mentions are kind of pretty glaring overtures. And what he mentioned about that there will be a big fight between different civilizations and this and that. So that's why we just wanted to dissect this book. We just wanted to uh, help you understand what are the issues. There are few things which are accurate, but I will have uh, four uh, speakers. They will uh, help you understand this book and they will bring their own comments. Now you must be thinking that why don't we invite all the pol uh, political science or uh, economists in order to understand this topic, I think we have to look at it from its multidisciplinary approach. That's why we have a historian here, we have one economist, we have English professor, and we have biologists. And my area is marketing and international business. So let's start from uh, Professor uh, Chris Pineworth, and let's see what he says about the clash of civilization. Chris? Yeah. Chris? You will have fun with it. I use this after that. Don't stop. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> Anwar. Um, let me just give you a little bit of my background. Um, I came to the department here at WT. My field of research, my field of specialization, are in African and Middle Eastern history. And therefore, I'm assuming that's why Anwar has me to speak about the books as I do. Um, do research in um, other civilizations, um, besides Western civilizations. I'll tell you right off the bat that, frankly, I don't find all that much that's earth shattering about this book. I also teach world civilization here at WT, and I find that approaching world history through civilizational studies is, in fact, a, a good way of, of finding the truth about world history. Um, so I would agree with Huntington that we can understand much about world history in terms of civilizational studies. However, having said that, I must add that I do have some very specific problems with Huntington's book, um, particularly with the ways he defines his civilizations. First of all, I find that some of his definitions are just a little bit too past. For example, one of the distinctive civilizations he defines in his book is Japan, J Japanese civilization. And I feel that he does this in order to get around problems explaining Japan's current reluctance or perhaps its current inability to involve itself in the affairs of ASEAN, that is the um, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or its conflicted relationship with China. But as a student of world history, it seems fairly clear to me that Japan, Japan's cultural heritage is every bit as intricately wound up with the cultural, cultural heritage of East Asian civilization as America's cultural heritage is wound up with Western civilization. Thus, I don't think that Japan really stands apart as a separate civilization. It is instead a member of East Asian civilization, or as Huntington refers to in his book, Sinic civilization even if it is a somewhat extreme form of this. Okay. But he uses this sort of definition. He defines it as a separate civilization um, because he's looking for an explanation here. Um, furthermore, some of the other civilizations that he talks about in his book, I think, are suffer from the opposite problem. That is, they are far too broad. As an example, he talks about Islamic civilization. And if you take a look at the map that he gives us in his book, Islamic civilization stretches from Morocco and Senegal in the West, countries in northern and western Africa, all the way through the Middle East, across South Asia, and into Southeast Asia and Indonesia. This seems to be too all-encompassing to serve as a useful tool for analysis. By the same token, he defines African civilization as including all of the African peoples south of the Sahara. And this, I think, is evidently 
nothing more than a product of his ignorance, which assumes that all African nations, all African peoples, must be more or less alike. These rather slipshod definitions then get him into trouble. In chapter 6 of his book, he asserts that international organizations based on a single civilization and the paradigm he uses, the example, the prime example he uses is NATO. These sorts of international organizations are far more likely to be effective than trans civilizational organizations. Okay, NATO is an effective organization. I will grant you that. But if there is a quote unquote Islamic civilization that encompasses all Islamic peoples, why then is the organization of the Islamic Conference such an ineffective organization? If there is a pan African civilization, why is the Organization of African Unity such an impotent organization? Moreover, he has trouble defining core states. Now, in every civilization that he defines in the book, he picks out a core state. Um, in Western civilization, the current core state is the United States, which probably betrays its own biases. In East Asian civilization, the Sinai civilization, the core state is obviously China. But he has trouble finding a core state for African civilization or a core state for Islamic civilization. And, and I think that's probably because these are not unified civilizations. They are simply the, the product of his own facile assumptions about these kinds of peoples. In my view, there are at least three and possibly four separate regional civilizations in Africa. And likewise, it seems to me more useful to look at Islamic, at the Islamic world, in ethnic rather than religious terms. Hence, we would have an Arab civilization with Egypt, perhaps, as its core state, a Turkic civilization with the Republic of Turkey as its core state, an Indo-Iranian civilization with Iran, I'm sorry, not Pakistan, as its core state. In addition, Huntington seems to view his civilizations, or at least the non-Western civilizations, as static, and he also tends to slip into easy caricatures about these civilizations. Thus, he refers, rather thoughtlessly, I think, to, quote, Islamic intolerance, unquote, Confucian arrogance, unquote, and so forth. And this, of course, does help to explain his overly broad definitions of these civilizations. He remains, at heart, a Western and thus indulges in a typically Western practice of lumping groups of people together based on a perceived otherness, something that's other than Western civilization. For example, the Islamic faith. Therefore, everyone who participates in the Islamic faith must belong to an, an, an overarching pan-Islamic civilization. But in his book, he does define three separate Christian civilizations, for example. He talks about Western civilization, essentially Central and Western Europe, plus North America, and extensions into uh, the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand. He talks about an Orthodox civilization, Russia, and other Orthodox nations of Southern and Eastern Europe. And he talks about a Latin American civilization, which again would be a Catholic Christian civilization. But if there can be three civil, three Christian civilizations, why not three or more Islamic civilizations? Furthermore, is it really safe to assume, as Huntington seems to be doing, that individuals within a given civilization would identify so strongly with that particular civilization or that particular culture? Don't individuals, and ask yourselves, I mean, we're all individuals, don't we as individuals decide for ourselves how to respond to particular situations? Don't most people see themselves as first a member of a much more particularistic group within a given civilization? And if you want evidence of this, I mean, just ask any Irishman about the English. They all participate in the same civilization, yes. But don't they make decisions on those more particularistic points of view? I might also add, as a northerner, transplanted to Texas, you could also ask any Texas about those damn Yankees. <laughs> okay. Finally, I really don't find anything that is particularly relevatory in his analysis. He 
He asserts that future conflicts will largely be cultural conflicts between different civilizations. Okay, what's new about this? I am, as I say, a student of world history. I teach world history at WT. And when I examine world history, it seems to me that these sorts of cross-cultural conflicts have been going on since the beginning of human history. Egyptians versus Hittites, Persians versus Greeks, Romans versus Germans, Arabs versus Turks, Chinese versus Mongols, Europeans versus anybody that came across. And here we find the crux of the matter. In the last two or three or four centuries, Western Europeans managed to establish economic and sometimes political hegemony over almost the entire globe. This led to the mistaken impression on the part of Westerners and the part of Europeans that they had also established cultural hegemony. And I think of a marketing textbook I saw a few years ago. Um, <coughs> the title page had a photograph of a Maasai boy drinking Coca-Cola. I mean, what could be more expressive of Western cultural hegemony? But just as recent events in Europe have shown that Eastern European nationalism remained latent under Russian hegemony following the Second war, just waiting to burst forth again once the Soviet Union came to an end, it should come as no surprise that the various non-Western civilizations that were briefly dominated in historical terms by the West had not been extinguished or assimilated, but had simply lain dormant, waiting to reassert themselves when the opportunity arose. In this regard, it seems particularly significant that the two regions with which the West currently has its most conflicted relationships, that is East Asia and the Middle East, are regions that, unlike Africa or South Asia, were never fully incorporated into the Western imperial system of the late 19th and 20th century. Essentially, my reaction to Huntington's thesis here is, what could be more natural? Western civilization has had its heyday, it is now in decline, Therefore, the other global civilizations that once dominated are reasserting their independence. There's absolutely not, nothing new or unexpected about this. 22 centuries ago, the Hellenistic civilization of the Middle East began to decline, and Persian culture reasserted itself under the Parthian dynasty. 11 centuries ago, the Arab Caliphate went into decline, and once again, Persian culture reasserted itself under the Samanid dynasty. Here in the late 20th century, Western civilization is beginning to slip, and the Persian culture has reasserted itself yet again under the Islamic Republic of Iran. As the French say, it's a change for sailors. The more things change, the more this is. Here, then, I think, is the principal weakness of Huntington's work, his lack of historical or at least his inability to express a historical perspective. Is he right that the world is divided into different civilizations? Yes, of course it is. Is he correct in asserting that cultural differences sometimes lead to conflict? Yes, of course. There is nothing new about either one of these allegations. But of course, as we discover, his main purpose in writing this book is not to reveal new truths, but to remind his audience of old truths. In the final chapter, we find that this book has been intended as an admonition to Western readers to reinvigorate Western civilization, but more importantly, to cease illusory efforts to impose Western culture on the rest of the world. He notes, and for this, I think that he should be applauded, that, quote, Western intervention in the affairs of other civilizations is probably the single most dangerous source of instability and potential global conflict in a multi-civilizational world, unquote. In the end, then, I do find myself in agreement with Huntington when he says that Western universalism is not just futile, but that it is dangerous, and that in a world of re-emerging civilizations, perhaps the best we can hope for is a consensus of cultural commonalities. Next speaker, Pat Kelso.
from economics department that
tigers has been doubling. Uh, GDP is doubling about every 10 years uh, for the last 30 years. And uh, that's, that's rapid growth. The uh, question I kind of have, though, is about the usual explanation, which is certainly includes uh, Huntington's explanation, that it has something to do with the culture in particular, and also that it's going to be necessarily a big challenge for the future. <clears throat> the one immediate problem you have with uh, the thing about it being the, the Asian culture is a lot of these Asian tigers aren't even really in the same culture. Indonesia is one of them, as a matter of fact. In Malaysia, I believe Huntington makes them Muslim uh, cultures. And then we have uh, the fact that many other countries, many other cultures have uh, grown with the same strand, starting with Imperial Germany uh, around 1880 to First World War I and uh, Soviet Union in the 1950s. Uh, Several European countries also, Greece for a while in the 60s, uh, Italy here more recently, a uh, number of Latin American countries here recently, notably Chile, have been using the same strategy. The uh, political regime in some of these uh, other countries has been similar, like one party rule or that sort of thing, but not all of them have been. Uh, the culture uh, it's not the same, certainly not according to Huntington, although when you look at what's supposed to be unique about the Confucian culture, uh, you do see a lot of mention of things like uh, uh, their values being uh, for thrift and diligence and discipline and personal responsibility, and uh, what's sometimes called collect collectivity, that is a sort of family and group loyalty above individual interest. That's about the only one that's, I would even say, is non-Western. And I kind of have a feeling if you ask people from other cultures whether they were thrifty or diligent or that sort of thing, they'd probably say yes. So I don't know how much the culture really matters. I'm not sure how much the political system necessarily, how critical it is. The, uh, the strategy seems to work for a lot of countries. <clears throat> You're going to stop me. I wasn't even here. Sir. Thank you, Ben. Our next speaker, Carl Schuster, professor of biology at Amarillo College. my invitation to this panel discussion was, quite frankly, confusion. I'm a systematic zoologist, which means for me to try and read and dissect a book like this is kind of akin to having distinguished members of our panel read a, a genetics text and just, you know, go through it and come up with some kind of intelligent discussion. And I sat back and I started to read the book because I was intimidated at first. And I realized that in a big way, this does touch on my field. A systematic zoologist is someone who looks at populations of animals. And we try to predict how these different populations will interact when they come in contact with each other. Wow. Exactly what this book hopes to do. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you'll notice, he even uses, Huntington actually uses some very biological terms. I um, brought a couple of them to you. Uh, he uses the word adapt and evolve constantly. And Quigley's seven stages of civilization, I'm saying Quigley, include gestation, aging, and decay. Wow, biology, right? So I felt more and more comfortable with this. According to Huntington, future conflicts between civilizations, what I, what I interpret as distinct populations of human beings, won't be between rich versus poor, because 
these, at this level, we would lack resources and unity. Neither will they be based on cultural lines or, or on or on state identity lines, because this is not how we identify ourselves. And in fact, I think I've seen this in my work. Something I forgot to mention is that I have worked in Latin America as a systematic zoologist, and I've also worked quite a bit with the Japanese for a while I worked for the United Nations. And I think I can say that I've seen that in some of this work, that people do tend to identify themselves on, on this level. Now, Huntington's paradigm is that although other levels of organizations exist, he does not deny this, he says that the one that acts as the best predictor for the general standing of these civilizations in the future is this civilization level. In other words, that the rich versus poor paradigm is, is far too general to, to make any predictions. That it, it exists. And I, I love this, this phraseology here. He says it sacrifices reality parsimony. Biologist, I, I just love that phrase. While the realist, or what he terms the failed state viewpoint, that individual states are locked into this rigorous battle, he says at this level, and the suspension, the suspicion and conflict, is almost, it's almost too realistic and misses the overlying pattern. It sacrifices parsimony for reality. In other words, the strength of this argument for me as a biologist is that it does hope to jettison variables at other levels. And biology went through the same kind of shift in the age with the onset of what we call landscape biology or ecology. Now, one advantage I have is I, I'm assuming that there's no other biologists in the room. It means I can throw around a lot of jargony phrases, and you guys have no idea. You just have to take my word for it, right? <laughs> Including the other panel members. <laughs> but what landscape ecology hope to do was model, in this case, ecological conflicts by determining what the different levels are in the hierarchy and determining which level is best to make a prediction from, not saying that the other levels don't exist and they don't interact and that the rules on one level do not affect other levels. Of course they do. But all we care about is prediction in the end as scientists. And here, again, is where he uses words like evolve and adapt. It's perfect. And perhaps it's true, perhaps the many conflicting variable, variables at, at, of geo, geopolitical organization, say, for example, the culture of the state level, there's just too many different variables at this level to really make any predictions over a couple of hundred years, while major categories like rich versus poor, east versus west, are just too vague and, and don't represent how people identify themselves. So I'm willing to accept that to some degree. The problem with Huntington's thesis in my, my mind, however, is twofold. First, he is not, and these are not my words, these are the words of Ronald Steele in an article he wrote for the New Republic. He hasn't jettisoned enough in order to really liberal, liberate himself from this culture-based or state-based predictive model. He's just exchanged, in my mind, word, cultures or states with civilization. Maybe this is useful. I don't know. Maybe we'll know in a couple hundred years. Right? I don't know. But that is something that I definitely saw on all of this. I question whether he was making really a good distinction between these two levels. And it brings up the question then are the gaps between civilizations more important than the gaps between cultures or states? Which will drive human interaction over the next 200 years. I don't know. I don't know. I was hoping that the other panel members would be able to answer that before I stood up, because then I could just say I agree. And I'm sure we'll discuss that after we're all done with our integral statement. Secondly, I did feel that Huntington did ignore too much the, the what I call in my notes, the rich versus poor paradigm, the interactions at, at this general broad level. For instance, if you're going to look at the rise of the United States, or what he calls Western, but as was pointed out, he identifies the United States as the core state. You know, are we just going to ignore the, the, the Industrial Revolution? Are we going to ignore the fact that the United States or in Western Europe had a lot of places to expand to in the year 1700? 
you know, and how does that affect what's happening now in Islam? I, I don't know. It wasn't touched upon in the book. Now again, uh, I, uh, I can pick apart a couple of things. I have where it's in Latin America, and I think my biggest problem is actually with this definition of, of Latin America as a separate civilization than ours. Um, he, he spends a lot of time setting up a rather, what I found a, a fairly rigorous, although it was vague at times, but a fairly rigorous definition of a civilization, as hard as that would be. And then with Latin America, he says, well, there are different civilizations because they're Catholic. And thereby just ignoring all the rules that he set up. He's, they're Catholic and therefore they're a different civilization. <coughs> now I, I, of course, question that immediately. And I have a hard time thinking that the United States has had more cultural unity over the last 200 years with Greece, for example, than they have with Mexico, or economic or cultural, etc. And I lived for a little while in El Paso and Albuquerque, so believe me, I have a hard time with that. The other thing um, that I saw was his idea of this process of indigenization, which I'm glad that I was actually able to spit out, you know, slipping over. Whether this process has really accepted, I should point out one of his main themes is this process has accelerated in recent years. And he gives some pretty good examples of some fairly major leaders over the last few years who were educated in the West, and they went back to their their, their various countries or various civilizations and, and took on a more traditional outlook. And, and that didn't happen with Gandhi, you know, a long, you know, a lot earlier in the century. I think I could have named just as many times that that happened, you know, in the last couple of hundred years as it has in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, what I'll say is that, then just to finish up very quickly, is that I felt this book fell into a trap that a lot of what I'll call, and I use, and I'll be very careful about using this term, but social scientists fall into, and that trying to take a very rigorous paradigm, try to make it a predictive model in a situation that, although you would like to be able to do it, there's so many variables at so many different levels that to be able to distinguish which are which are the stronger roles. Very difficult to do. Our final speaker, David Zimmerman, Amarillo College. Looking at the title of the book, I'm reminded of my twins yesterday. They got in the car. And Ada immediately pointed at Aiden, my little girl pointed at my little boy, and said, Aiden bit someone. And I turned to Aiden, did you bite someone? Casey took my hat. That's all he would tell me. Casey took my hat. Aiden bit someone, Casey took my hat. At that point, I'm in a quandary. What, what do I do? Where do I go from here? Um, why wasn't Aiden telling me the whole truth? Well, the note from the teacher explained the whole truth. Someone had taken Aiden's hat and he had bitten them in retaliation. That was the truth, right? There's my objective authority. Ada's purpose in telling me that was to get her brother in time out, being the loving, doting sister she is, who says there's some pleasure to see Aiden sitting in time out. Aiden, on the other hand, wasn't going to tell me that he'd bitten someone and condemn himself. Now, what does all this have to do with the clash of civilizations? I don't know. They were tearing up my notes while they were doing this whole argument. <laughs> uh, it struck me that Huntington's doing the same thing to us. Huntington's been labeled by Stephen Walt as a master of the scholarly soundbite. Now, it's interesting, the scholarly soundbite in this case is 300 pages long, and has 20 pages of notes, but I'd argue it's a soundbite nonetheless. I think you would agree. To attempt to cover African civilization in 10 pages, 20 pages, 30 pages is a soundbite nonetheless. In doing this, he necessarily leaves out some information. He has to. There's no question about it. And at that point, being the English major I am, I guess, I have to ask why. What are you hiding from me? I guess that has more to do with my distrustful nature than anything else. What are you hiding from me? Why does Huntington leave out certain things and why does he include in certain things? What is he trying to promote? What is he trying to accomplish? As already been said here today in multiple articles, the overwhelming response to it is 
through his book, in many cases, is, so what? Sometimes civilizations who aren't the same flash. That's no great revelation for me, and I, I get most of my information on civilization from friends. Um, what is the purpose in showing this stuff in those terms? And that's where I would like to begin. What is Huntington trying to tell us in life? I think it goes back to a topic that's been brought up twice already, is that Huntington is speaking from a distinctly Western perspective, and we have to remember that throughout. At one point, he shows us his hand. He tells us states in recent years have lost power. Well, yes, Western states have lost power. And I'm not a social economist, but I would assume that, on the other hand, traditional colonies have at the same time regained some power. I hope I'm correct in that assumption. Um, he is speaking to us from the Western civilization mindset. When he talks to us about what distinguishes civilizations, the one characteristic he points to time and again is religion. But instead of telling us how that religion shapes the civilization, how that religion, how the people interact, that relate, how that religion interacts with the economy, he instead points to it as evidence of a revival of non-Western, uh, a revival of anti-Westernism in non-Western countries. What he's done is dismiss these people's spiritual experience, their cultural experience, and to some extent, to some extent, I really want to qualify that, told us they're doing it your thing. Now, that, of course, that's an oversimplification. The message is there. Religion is placed within the context of the Western perspective, the Western view of that religion. Once again, why is he telling us this? What is he left out? He points time and again throughout the book to political leaders who extol cultural and civilizational values. As one author points out, he never questions why those leaders are extolling those values, or if they're willing to back those values up with blood and treasure, as I think the term is used. Huntington has an agenda. There's a definite agenda to the work. Now the question is, is, it, is the agenda simply to maintain tenure at Harvard? Or is it to give us a better understanding, help us put our house in order, as one author suggests? Is it trying to explain to us how we need to put our house in order? He time and again overlooks the fact that we are, if in fact we are losing power, nevertheless, the anti-Westernism he points to reflects a defensiveness, a concern on the part of other civilizations. The very fact that they're anti-Western implies they feel some sort of threat from Western society. What kind of questions does that raise for his model? Huntington's point of view, then, is shaped and limited by his Western upbringing, which is fine. Mine is too, I see. But in trying to explain the movement of civilizations, in trying to explain how these civilizations are predict, is probably more accurate, how these civilizations are going to respond to one another, at some point he's going to have to be able to step outside of that civilization and understand why, as he says, Islam is bloody. Why is that the case? It's a broad generalization that he gives me that is not explained within the context of their religion. Instead, it's explained from the Western context. It seems bloody to us. I would suggest that it has that the work is tied intricately to his audience. Uh, and Mark suggests in his article that's going to be published that this is written in layman's terms. That must be me. I can't balance my checklist, but much less determine the famous civilization body of the world economy. Um, if he's writing to the layman, he leaves out essential information. He quotes part of Toynbee and overlooks another part of Toynbee, a, contradict a part of Toynbee's theory that uh, disagrees with his theory. Who is his audience? His audience is. is seems to be a group who perceives the loss of power, a group who feels under attack. He constantly appeals, uh, the, um, another term for memoir is, um, and now I can't find it, another term from memoir, what was the memoir I told you for? Plundered voice, a group who feels that we've been plundered somehow, that we're under threat. My concern then is so what? My concern with this is, not that it can predict future courses, but the effect it has on the audience. What is this so much of this work? Aiden almost had me convinced he didn't buy anyone until I saw that note. Ada's not a very reliable witness. 
right? He almost had me commit. He had almost achieved his objective of getting me to behave in a certain way. Huntington's doing the same thing. The man is eloquent. He's well informed, much better educated than I could ever hope to be. His knowledge of world history, world affairs, world civilization, world economies, world religion is intimidating. I think where is Carl's term? Again, reading this and thought Anwar setting me up. I don't know what he did. I did to him, but it's a setup. <laughs> 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 nevertheless, nevertheless, in the gym is there. The paranoia that Anwar points to in Clash of Civilization is real. And it's it's dangerous in that by following this model, our enemies become easily identifiable. By following this by following this model, we're able to predict future enemies. Not based on how we've responded to them in the past, not how, based on how we can respond to them right now, but how they look, what they believe, whether or not they share our background. I my concern with the book, and of course Carl contradicted contradicted this as a finder. My concern is that it reinforces um, traditional parent prejudices. It reinforces xenophobia. Those foreigners must be dangerous. And ultimately, the so what of the work is, what is the effect it has on this audience? What is the ultimate input this is going to have over its readers? Like me, whose knowledge is limited. Like me, who are gullible. Like me, who are ignorant of the world of good. You're going to be left believing or fearing, possibly even worse, that you know, fear that somehow, somehow, this future world that he is describing is openly hostile and antagonistic towards the West. And I, I'm concerned with that message. Thank you. Thank you we had wonderful comments, excellent <laughs> views. Uh, let's uh, hear from your side. Question from the audience. We'll open this floor for you, please. Comments, questions from the audience? I think the topic is very controversial. Yes, Ben? Let me ask Chris a question. I, I, I mean, a deficit in the first place. He said, did not read the book. I'm trying to glean or whatever understanding I can from the comments of our commentators. Chris, you made the assertion that Western civilization is in a state of decline. Yes. What is your... What is your measuring rod for that assertion? Well, that uh, 100 years ago, Western civilization uh, managed to dominate the entire globe with the possible exception of Japan in economic terms and um, directly control in political terms uh, something, uh, something like 70% of the world's land surface. And today we don't. In terms of geography, I would agree. In terms of gross domestic product, in terms of ownership of critical resources, I would totally disagree. And in terms of, of the West um, proportion of the, of the world's of the world GDP, sure. Do you think that it is higher today than it was 100 years ago? In absolute terms of that question, now relatively speaking, of course not, because when you start with a very low GDP, a very easy to W GDP. Pat mentioned that in 10 years, countries such as, or whatever, increased their GDP by one, by two times, or, or 100%. Very simple, very easy to do, relatively speaking, if a country like Jamaica with a GDP of $200 per capita per year, relatively easy to go to 400 per right. year. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's more difficult to go from 18000 to 36000 Right, but I guess what I'm saying is that the proportion of the world's production, the proportion of the world's GDP is now controlled by the West is much smaller than it was 100 years ago. Would you disagree with that? No, I wouldn't, but in terms of the quality of the GDP... Well, quality, I guess you know, what I'm saying here, then, is the West is declining in relative terms. Uh, is the West weak? No, of course we're not. But are we relatively weaker today than we were 100 years ago compared to the rest of the world? Yes, we are, in relative terms. We are no longer capable of dominating the world economically, and we are certainly nowhere near um, the, cap the capability we have of dominating the world politically and militarily. Uh, 
hundred years ago, if we had a problem with China, we sent in the gunboats. Nobody gave a second thought. Last year, we had a problem with China. We sent in the Seventh Fleet, but did they fire any shots? No. We, we, we don't have the ability to, um, to act high-handedly in the world as we did a century or a century. I've got a question of ability, I've got a question of maturity and understanding the geopolitical world in which you operate. So to decide to kind of get along, you've got to kind of go along with it. Well, as um, you know, as a student of world history, I would um, probably say the first or the second. I don't know that we are becoming more mature and more understanding. I think that we, I think well, what we understand is that we can't act high hand. <coughs> Whereas 100 years ago, we thought we could do it. And like one thing, we didn't have to take with Grenada and Hanwhal. No. We did it there. No, we thought we could. But can you imagine the opium war happening today, for example? I, I, I frankly can't make those comparisons because of the nature of technology and the way the world has evolved. I mean, you thought, in my conception, and not the way I'm thinking, is that it's, it's, it's a different world. I can't conceive of the United States blowing up Iraq now. You know, unilateral if we want to do that. Which might be the equivalent of the Opium War to the Eastern Army. Pardon? Yeah, I mean, cool. Would there be any value in, in trying to analyze the strengths of each of these civilizations that we're referring to in the view of what we suspect will happen in? world history in the next few hundred years. I, 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 my problem is, what is a civilization? What is its strength? Can it change? How will it affect things? Who's going to answer me? <laughs> I'll, I'll be uh, first. Hey, I can't do that. <laughs> 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 I, can't, I can't imagine trying to, uh, to, to find what I expect to happen in the next few hundred years. Um, and, you know, at the point, I guess, you know, to, to address one of your questions here, um, one of the points I was trying to make is is exactly that. How do we define these civilizations? Um, Huntington, as a method of doing this, I don't agree with this method of doing it. Um, and I already pointed out some of the problems I've got with the civilizations that he does define. Um, but I think, you know, various people approaching this question would probably define so how do you decide what civilization is? You have the same problem with strengths, which would depend on what the future has to hold for us. Whether something would be a strength or a weakness. All you really say is we have attributes, and uh, some of them may turn out to be good, some may not. And where do you find the objective of the nerve? And where do you even go to hope to find that? I mean, that's we have enough problems in biology. If I look at various groups of rodents, you know, I still bring in my own views when I'm looking at, you know, which traits I'm going to use and which traits. And then in biology right now, it's changing because of that. We decided to throw away a whole bunch of stuff. Except I can tell a civil mission kind of hope. I need to do that. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if the <laughs> but, uh, I was just wondering if you just saw why they brought up the argument of the wall street and how the periphery and the semi periphery and the core was from the economic perspective. Can you mention what the wall street is? Just discussing the introductory chapter is what he's talking about. Nations are declining or not? What, uh, in the his, in the past history, it's more sensational to to judge Western power maybe with uh, uh, military exertion of force. But wouldn't you say it's more settled now as far as economically? You know, like. For
for example, China wants to increase their standard of living, so they're going to play more by the game so that the World Bank will give them more loans. Or Don't you think the, the pressure is more subtle where it's not really out in the open? The World Bank or the IMF is a tool of imperialism. Is that true? Maybe, or 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 just wanting to uh, entice foreign capital investment. Don't you think that they have to change their political system or their legal system to encourage that? And so, in other words, are they buckling under pressure from the West to play the game? I, I kind of uh, I kind of have problems with talking about economic power.
power and cultural influence that your country now follows our power. And the military and the military. I would tend to follow your argument and also that our culture has made inroads. You can't view culture as a simple, a single monolithic force. It's made up of a multitude of things, all of them different, interacting in different ways. And in many ways, you look at various cultures throughout the world and you can see how they've adopted. Maybe not completely integrated, but that raises a whole other question. What is the difference between a superficial interaction with something in a meaningful direction, interaction? But they've adopted various American myths, like you mentioned the young boy drinking in the stroke. There's something superficial about that. But on the other hand, when you read the literature of other cultures, you see um, the overlapping of the cultures in the literature. There's something completely more. Um, Japanese writers adopting um, American drama or you see um, American short story writers adopting Black American techniques. Uh, I think that reflects an exchange on a deeper level. And like you said, right, we're so often trying to point it at all the voice drinking and go to the American Americans. Right, or we have Sudi Pons. Right, so there's, 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 there's a misconception there, but nevertheless, I think at some point the two cultures interact on a deeper level and that. That somehow affects. I don't know that it's can be used as a power tool, though. It's a coercive tool. And I'll, I think it's fun to say that I go up here from the Amazon and discuss this in the car. <coughs> and, and I'll point out, I don't think that this is more specific. I don't think satellite issues have more of a role, or computers have more of a force of, of making these cultural lines blurred than you know, funny did. And we didn't. And these lines didn't disappear with either one. I, I lived in Paraguay. As a matter of fact, I lived there, uh, for those of you who don't know this, Paraguay is a very small South American country. I lived there right when the, the, the wall came down. So then, uh, I actually, they went through a revolution in their dictatorship for 45 years. The longest standing dictatorship in the world, Alfredo Stroke, and I got to see the overthrow. It was quite exciting. It went five minutes. <laughs>
by the same token, we too are changing. Is Western civilization becoming something different as well? Because weren't we also influenced by those other civilizations around the world? Uh, yes, but that, back to my point again, uh, to uh, interrupt. I think uh, it's a wonderful discussion, but at this time I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jennifer Coons, our president. We have something for our speakers in order to appreciate. We have certificates for them. Jennifer? The certificate uh, read, uh, read uh, Phi Beta Delta Honor Society for International Scholars, Alpha Psi Chapter, West Texas TNF, recognize it. Chris Byron, Pat Kelso, Carl Schuster, and David Zimmerman as a panel speaker. And uh, I will uh, give it to Jennifer. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to say that I was in Uruguay in 1985 yes. when they were changed from the military government. There they were watching uh, reruns of Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we really like to thank our speakers for coming in, and Anwar for uh, organizing this. Uh, thank you very much. And I have a certificate this way. If I can get you to come over here so I can show you the uh, Chris, your <laughs> uh, Pat Kelso. And David 
Zimmerman. Uh, we'd like to remind you that if you're a student and are interested in being a member of Phi Beta Delta, you need to have a 3.0 GPA, but we're always looking for members and also faculty. Um, our final uh, meeting for the semester will be December 2nd, the Tuesday after uh, Thanksgiving in this room, same time. And we're going to have a panel of international students speaking, and also we'll have our elections for our new officers for the next year. Thank you very much. Before you leave, uh, I would like you to know that uh, we have some membership forms over there, and uh, we would love to induct you into this organization, and we do appreciate it. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.